Brilliant. I'm going to begin with a prayer that we often use at the start of one of our services. And it says this, Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ooh. Great, thank you. So, we're going to be thinking about prayer this week, next week, and the week after. There's lots that could be said. So, let me just begin with a few questions, okay? And these are rhetorical, you don't have to answer them, but think about them. When was the last time you prayed, not in church? I wonder, do you have a regular pattern with prayer? If I asked everyone here to stand up, if you're satisfied with your personal prayer life, what would you do? I would sit down because I am dissatisfied with my personal prayer life. And so I feel very inadequate to preach on this topic of prayer because I am still a struggling student when it comes to prayer. I am still learning. So uh, bear with me. Another question. Do you know anyone who should pray less? I bet you don't. I mean, this is a potentially guilt-inducing topic, isn't it? So let me tell you, right from the start, as we begin this new three-week topic on the, on the three-week sermon series on the topic of prayer, we're not having this mini-series to make you feel guilty about prayer. I am not here to beat you with a stick into praying, okay? Do I deeply desire that we would all grow in maturity in our faith, so that we would deeply desire to spend more time in prayer with our Heavenly Father, that we would hunger for him and seek after him and plead with him for all sorts of things in prayer. Of course, I long this for me, I long it for you, and I long it for us all corporately as a church, because it's good for us. My deep prayer for this sermon series is that the Lord would use it mightily to move us as a church family toward him. That we would all grow in our understanding of what prayer is and how to pray. So over the next three weeks, we're going to consider the following things. What is prayer? Uh, we're going to explore why we don't pray. We're going to look at how not to pray before we spend the biggest chunk of time over three weeks looking at how to pray. And along the way, there'll be lots of practical suggestions and tips, and I'll share some book ideas with you too. Um, so, I think I've got part of Rodney in my mouth. <laughs> That's difficult. Right, good. Uh, before we dive in though, let's be 100% clear, okay? Again, this is rhetorical, but think about this question. Oh, it's terrible using a puppet, isn't it, before you preach? <laughs> Um, will God love you more if you pray more? Have a think about that. Don't shout out, just weigh the question. You might know the answer in your head, but does it make a difference how you live your life? Will God love you more if you pray more? Or often I find it helpful to flip things around the other way, okay? So... Let's say, for example, you didn't pray this morning before you came to church. Does God love you less? Wait the question. Does God love you less if you pray less? It's really good to be thinking about this after Easter. Because at Easter time, we see in beautiful technical of God's love for us and how unconditional it is. So as we look at this topic of prayer over the next three weeks, do so clearly understanding that there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. Nothing. And there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. 
Do you see, God's love for you is not dependent on what you do. It's dependent on his character. It's not dependent on how much you pray, how many books you read, how many times you come to church, how much you give to church or how much you give to charity. Nothing like that. He loves you because he made you. And Jesus died for you to rescue you from your sin before you'd even considered doing anything for him, even praying. So don't think that after this series, God will love you more because you pray more. He can't love you more than he already does because he already loves you perfectly in Christ. And he's shown that by sending Jesus to die for you and to rise again and triumph over the grave, giving you hope for the future. So that's the kind of context, all right? So let's have a look at this question. What is prayer? Now, the answer I always used to give to this question is that prayer is talking to God. And um, we had that in a more simple form with Rodney earlier, didn't we? And it is in so many ways. Prayer is talking to God, but it's not just talking to God. It's so much more. I talk to the person who kindly serves me at the checkout in the supermarket, but it doesn't go any further than that. It's more when we talk to God, isn't it? Uh, when I was growing up, we used to sing a song in church called Prayer is Like a Telephone. You might have uh, come across it. Uh, prayer is like a telephone for us to talk to Jesus. Prayer is like a telephone for us to talk to God. Uh, no, I'll be fine. I'll swallow it. Yeah. Uh, prayer is like a telephone for us to talk to Jesus, pick it up and use it every day. And then it's got like a little chorus bit. We can shout out loud. We can whisper softly. We can make no noise at all. But he'd always hear our call. Because prayer is like a telephone. It's really, sil really simple and it's really helpful. But it's limited. Our understanding of prayer today, I want it to be more than just talking to God. Because prayer is talking to God, a bit like on the telephone, but the great thing about God, he's never out of range of reception, he's never out of charge, we're never out of credit, all of those kind of things. Prayer is more than just talking to God. So what is prayer? Well, it's something that people have written hundreds and thousands of books on over the course of human history. Is prayer spending time with God, enjoying his company, being in his presence, communing with him? Or is prayer pleading with God, asking for things, wrestling with him, pouring out our heart and feelings to him? Hmm. Which is it? Well, if we look at the whole of the Bible, surely we have to answer it's both. It's not an either or. Prayer is communing with God and pleading with him. So let's look at our first reading from Psalm 27. This is on page 557 uh, in your Bibles. It's worth having it open. Psalm 27. Look at these words from verse 4. This is what David says. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that my dishwasher would be repaired because it's been annoying me for the past three weeks. No, not that, is it? Okay, let's try again. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that my headache would go because it really hurts. It's not that either, is it? Now, if you know anything about David's life, it was complicated. It was challenging. He was chased down to the point of death from his son. He had spears chucked at him from Saul. All sorts of things in David's life. What does he ask? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. David wants to dwell with his God. It's not for a repaired dishwasher or for his headache to go. But don't hear me wrong. Do pray about your dishwasher and do pray about your headache because God is interested in the details of your life. But don't only pray for that. David's desire is to commune with God, to be with him, to dwell with him, to spend time with him. Prayer isn't just talking to God, it's enjoying him. 
It's being with your heavenly Father. Look what David says later in the psalm. Verse 8. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. His heart's desire is to seek God's face, to be so close to him, to commune with him. Is that how we, is that how I, approach <coughs> prayer? So prayer is communing with God, and it's also pleading with him. Did you notice that from Psalm 13? If you turn to Psalm 13 on uh, page 548, just have a look there. What are the first three words of Psalm 13 on page 548? How long? How long? That's right. How long, Lord? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? How long, David asks. He's questioning God. He's pleading with him. And there are many in our congregation across our, th across our three churches who even today are praying those prayers because they've got long-term struggles. How long, Lord? And that's okay. That's how we should pray. With honesty, with rawness, openly sharing our heart and our pains and our desires with our Heavenly Father. Remember, as we do that, he's not going to love us less. He loves us perfectly. And he loves us inside out anyway, so he already knows what's on our heart. But it's for our good to pour it out to him. So we are to plead with God, to wrestle with him in prayer and to keep coming to him about the big things and the little things. And interestingly, the more we look at the Psalms, we see there's more psalms of pleading than there are of communing, if you like. But prayer is both, and so we must do both. Tim Keller is a, a well, he passed away last year, I think, was an American pastor. He wrote this. He says, um, A little reflection will show us that these two kinds of prayer are neither opposites nor even discrete categories. Adoring God or communing with Him is shot through with <coughs> supplication. That's asking for things. To praise God is to pray, hallowed be thy name. To ask him to show the world his glory so that we would all honour him as God. Yet just as adoration com contains supplication, so uh, like praising contains asking for things, so seeking God's kingdom must include prayer to know God himself. They both go together, that pleading and that adoring, that communing. It's both. Now, just to summarise things a bit more together, if you want a really neat and simple exercise to the uh, simple definition of the answer to the question, what is prayer, then this little book that I hope you've all got, kind of like one per household, um, is really helpful. It's called Enjoy Your Prayer Life, written by a guy called Michael Reeves, really short uh, chapters. He quotes a guy called John Kelvin, who you may or may not have heard of from a long time ago, who says this, prayer is the chief exercise of faith, right? So in other words, prayer is the primary way true faith expresses itself. And it expresses itself in these two ways, by communing with God and pleading with him. That's why we have those two envelopes with Rodney. It's talking to God and it's showing we trust him. Yeah? So what is prayer? Prayer is the chief exercise of faith. Now, flip that around the other way, and we see that prayerlessness is practical atheism. Whew. Ouch. Prayerlessness is demonstrating a lack of belief in God. Now that's challenging. That's in this little book. Do read it. Really, it's really helpful. Next week when we're thinking about prayer, we're going to think about reasons why we don't pray. But to draw us to a close today, we're going to think about how we can pray. Okay? How can we pray? Again, this is great to be thinking about, following on from Easter. We can pray because our access to God has been won through the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross and his resurrection. 
I've got some words from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Now, if you've got your magnifying glass, you'll be able to read them. <laughs> I'm going to read it out to you. It says this. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When Jesus died on the cross, he cried, it's finished, the job is done. And the camera panned away from the cross to the temple where the curtain was torn in two. This is the picture James was referring to that the kids will see in Jam Club today of the curtain. As that temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, it showed our access to God has now been opened. And it's all through Jesus' blood. Jesus there acted as our great high priest. He knows our goodness. He's fully experienced human life and so can sympathise with us, with you, with me. And he is there mediating for us, speaking to God on our behalf. So that we, simple and broken as we are, can approach the throne of grace. Did you spot that? Thinking back to our like verse for the year, God's grace is sufficient for us. We can approach God's throne. We can pray because of Jesus. Empowered by the Spirit to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Again, just going back to our <coughs> Trinity series in the autumn. It's the Trinity at work when we pray, isn't it? It's brilliant. So we can pray because of the finished work of God with Jesus finished work of Jesus. We can commune with him and we can plead with him. Just one final thing, just um, do read the book. I really trust that will be helpful to you. And then if, if you're thinking, you know, I, I would like to have a bit more of a regular pattern of prayer, but I just don't know how to start. On the bottom of the handout, there's four words that spell the word ACTS. Okay, it's just a little simple acronym to help you. When you start to pray, start with adoration. Or praise and I honestly think this will be the hardest thing for you to start with because often when you, when, you, when you start praising God you'll move into other things but to be disciplined even if it's just praising him for one thing I, I praise you God that Jesus came back to life I praise you God that you're full of grace I praise you God that you love me I praise you that you're holy something like that starting off acknowledging God for who he is then moving to confess your sins, saying sorry to God for the things we do wrong. It's great that we do that corporately each week together, but it's a really good discipline to do that individually as well during the week. Thanksgiving, actually, I was saying this a day earlier. It'd be really interesting to know the actual percentage of blessings that God gives us that we actually spot. Because I bet we don't spot half of them. There's lots that we can say thank you for even in hard times. And then supplication is asking, asking God for things, for those you know, for those that you love, for situations around the world, for ourselves. It just gives a little framework for how to pray. And I hope that's helpful. More tips will be coming over the next couple of weeks. Um, but let's pause now. Think about that question. If you pray more, will God love you more? If you pray less, will God love you less? We're gonna have a few moments of quiet. And then, Glenn, no pressure, but you're leading our intercessions today. But don't just do your normal thing. Um, and it's great to be able to pray corporately together. So a few moments of quiet, and then we will pray.